Yeah, you can have a microphone. Sure. Um, may seem like a dumb question, but um, I find as an artist, there's no, um, with social media and all that, there's no set way to do things, and you kind of just have to jump into it and guess a lot of the methods for doing it. Do you use Facebook purely as a business in the sense that you, as a personal individual, run it as a page so people like rather than friend request? Or do you do both? Do you use Facebook as a marketing tool so you have a page, you say, like a thousand likes, whatever, and then you have a personal page mm -hmm. for your family? Do you separate them or do you use just one thing together? I have a strong opinion on this one. <coughs> My opinion is that we shouldn't worry about pages until we have so many followers that we can't, uh, so many friends, which is 5,000 is the limit, that we can't have any more. So I'm on like 3,000 plus uh, friends without showing off. I don't know most of them, yeah. Um, and once I reach 5,000, then I will switch to being a page. You just use it as a page? Yes, yes, I have a private uh, profile. I used to have a page. And to be very honest with you, I bought 1,000 likes for like $50. And I thought that was the coolest, uh, you know, the coolest idea ever. And I still think it's kind of cool. But then I just didn't like communicating through the page. Because I'm all about this personal, you know, I'm very personal with my clients. My clients become my friends. Um, and, I'm like, I, and I felt like I was just hiding behind something, you know. So I had this page with thousand fake likes and few hundred actual likes and then I removed it and I only use uh, like a personal profile but obviously when you reach 5,000 then you can still get new followers but it kind of becomes a little bit so then so that's a luxury problem that I'm gonna have 5,000 friends and then I will switch to a page I like this whole idea of like I was taking, talking about humanization of business you know we want to be very human as artists I guess as well you know as business people for sure Um, you said um, if there is a conflict between spiritual and materialistic, uh -huh. you are always struggle with the money. Mm -hmm. This is for me is very interesting. So okay, you would you like me to elaborate on this one, yeah? Let me just push myself a little bit because I have the sun in my face right now. Okay, that's better. Now I have a lamp in my face. That's okay. <laughs> okay now. I always say that I like that being in a flash, so I shouldn't complain now. Um, thinking how to answer that uh, in the best way. Um, it's like if you see, you see, I see money, I see money is just an energy, just another form of energy. And when I coach people, I say, okay, um, you are interested in this energy. I will give you this energy, coaching, in exchange for this energy called money. And I happen to charge a lot because that's how, I, that's how much I value myself right now. Um, but it's still the energy. But I've made a peace with money long time ago. I never had a problem with money as an energy. What I had a problem was the belief how much money I can actually make. But again, for personal development, I, I cleared that out and now I know that I believe that I can make any amount of money I want. Do I want to be a billionaire? Probably not. I just don't care about being a billionaire because I'm high maintenance, but I'm not that high maintenance. And, uh, you know, I just want to be comfortable. And I want everybody in my life to be comfortable. I want to be in a position when my friend is struggling. I'll be like, listen, here's 100K, you know, sort yourself out. I just love this idea of having this power of, of influencing people and changing lives even that way as well. But my point was that as long as we struggle with money in itself and then you know our ability to make money as a belief as a part of our belief system we will struggle in making money so we need to say okay i can i'm capable of making money this is how much i want and you want to be super clear about how much you want to make i have my you know annual goals, financial goals as a part of other goals. I have my um, monthly goals. I'm very clear every month what amount I'm going for. And an interesting thing happens, I've noticed, when we are very clear about our goals. 
the universe responds. Like this bloody thing can hear us, you know. You know, it's about setting this it's about setting this very clear intention, you know. Because the setup that I see is like the universe says, okay, you tell me exactly what you want and I will help you get it. Some computer game I don't have. Um, that's the setup. And the universe says, okay, you take one step, I'll take two steps. You plant the seed. So the seed is, this is what I want. You water the seed with your thoughts. It's like, this is what I want, this is what I want. Setting the intention, very clear intention. And the universe says, okay, I'll take care of everything else. But it's never the case of like, I, I will give it to you because you are a nice human being, because you are good to other people, because you believe in your art. No, 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 no. The universe, I find the universe supports the strongest. It's not fair. I mean, it is in a way. The strongest, the most ambitious, the most driven. Not always the best people. You know, you see lots of assholes getting lots of money, right? So you can see clearly it's not about, I'm a good to other people. I'm always kind to other people. And the universe is like, so what? You know, but where is your goal? Where is your hunger? Where is your drive? Like, show me that you're hungry. It's like the same with me. It's like, if you want me to help you, show me that you give a fuck. You come to me as a client and, you, and, and I find myself in a situation when I feel like I care about your goals more than you care about your goals yourself. I'm like, listen, I mean, step up or I'm going to fire you as a client. I'll give you your money back, but I'm going to fire you because it's just not enjoyable. People will help you. People are there to help you. But show them that you care. Show them that you are hungry, you know. Tony, go on. Uh, thanks for that, Michael. Um, first, first thing I want to say is, um, um, for those of you who don't actually know who I am, that's not important. My name is Tony Fernandez. And if you don't know my name, that's fine. The FBI does. Uh, <laughs> Michael and I are, I just want to clarify this straight away, Michael and I are actually in a relationship. We're just in separate relationships. <laughs> I'm glad we got that over. Um, the reason I come to these things is I'm not a musician. I know a lot of musicians, I promote a couple of them, but repetition is the mother of success, and I think you'll agree with that. And that comes from Anthony Robbins, who uh, is probably one of Michael's um, early role models. Uh -huh. You're not quite there yet, but you'll get there. It's a different brand. But that's one of the reasons, every time I come to one of these things, I learn something different, which I hadn't picked up the first time. Today, for example, I got three different ideas. Michael and I are not in the same game. But I'll tell you one thing. Uh, one of the key things that he told me helped me to recover from a crash and burn in 2012, which is why I disappeared for a long time. And then when I came back, I came back with a vengeance. And I can only say that at this point in time, it's all happening at the same time. I just can't cope. It's a strategy is what I now need. So thank you very much for that. I'll shut up now and let you get on with it. Thanks, Tony. My favorite stalker. There's somebody, somebody behind you. Sorry. Um, one of the things that you were saying is that it's really important to, to do, like thinkers and you, just people that make, those are the people that make it. Producers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one, of the, one of the things that you actually need to do is like you need usually to, to take a step, to make a bold move and usually uh -huh. One of the things that happen when you're approaching a girl and when you're going to, when you have a demo and you're going to a studio and you need to knock on the door, you get that burn inside of you that makes your heart beat really fast or it makes you like voices inside that tell you, ah, I just, just they, they hold you back. So how, how do you, how do you like deal with those things and does it ever go away even if you deal with it often? Okay. You're talking about uh, failure slash rejection how to deal with it. Guys, I can promise you that I failed in my life more than anybody else in this room. And because I failed more than everybody else in this room, I'm more successful than most of you in this room. And I'm not talking just about financial success. This is just one of the areas. I'm talking about my personal life. I'm talking about my whatever, any area of, your, of my life I can think of. Because I'm prepared to fail over and over again, I succeed. Failure is great. 
rejection is great. When I hear no, no for me stands for, one second, no for me stands for next one. 99% women I ask out said no to me, 99%. But the ones that said yes rocked my world. 70% of people I meet for initial consultations for coaching say no to my coaching. I've run 217 initial consultations in the last 12 months. Most of these people, 70%, said no. But in the next 12 months, I will have another 217 or something like that, and 70% will say no. But the fact that I will say yes, but if you hear no and you just crumble and you say, I'm not good enough, the good thing about rejection is that if you experience it over and over again, it doesn't feel like rejection anymore. It doesn't bother you anymore. It's only initially the first couple of no's, a couple of tens of no's, or hundreds of no's. Yeah, it's not four or five, yeah? It's more. When you take it personally, it's like, shit. I remember stopping women on the street, you know, a few years ago, and I was on a no, they said no, and I was like, oh my God, I'm not good enough. I'm like, Jesus. I said no, but there was something in me. You gotta pursue it, you know? You like someone, you get to talk to them. Don't be a pussy, just be persistent, you know? meeting people for consultations and just having some terrible consultations. You know, things wouldn't be just jellying and they say no. And I'm like, maybe I'm not good enough as a coach, you know, and just internal battle. But because I'm prepared to keep failing, I will succeed more than any, anybody. More, more than anybody. Or more than most people, because I'm prepared to fail. And not take it personally, you know. It's, ne it's never... If you go to this guy and he says no, you, you don't want to take it personally. He doesn't know you. So you cannot be personal because he doesn't know you. He just knows a bit of your, a little bit of your expression. That's your expression. Or if it's a personal, you meet someone in the bar, they can never reject you because they don't know you. They can only reject the little experience of you that they had. And what I do when I get rejected or when I, when I fail, I think, okay, what's the next person? What's the next consultation that I'm going to have? Who is tomorrow on the schedule? And I, com I completely detach myself from this. So, okay, this is, this is the past. It's past. It's happened. I choose not to live in the past. I say, okay, what's, what's happening there? What's happening now? And what's happening there tomorrow? You know, and it's, you know, and it's about developing this thick skin. Like, if you... If you don't develop this thick skin over time, you have no, no chance in any business, whether it's a music business or whatever, you know. There will be people that will say you're not good enough. There will be people that say, who do you think you are, you know? What makes you think? Like, and you say, yes, yes. Okay, this is your opinion. And you just keep going. And no matter where you come from and how much you've produced so far, how old are you, you know, it doesn't matter if you are 15 or 65. Short, tall, fat, or skinny, it doesn't matter. The most persistent ones will get there, always. With the right strategy, of course, you know. So you gotta have some smarts, you know. Not necessarily like IQ or, or formal education, but some form of smarts. Tommy? Yeah, um, I would like to say that your very strong point is communication and brand. Uh -huh. You have this brilliant communication of everything you do, and you get the, your message across to people, mm -hmm. and also you have a very strong brand. So, will I you number one? I would like you to say a few things about this, about communication, right. because most musicians they just seem to be all over the place, mm -hmm. communicating the wrong message. And number two, do you think that fake it till you make it is a right strategy for people? Okay. So let me start with the second one: fake it until you make it. Absolutely. When I when I work with guys on uh, dating just maybe 20% of my clientele, 10 to 20% of my clientele, you know, uh, just got out of a long-term relationship, I have no clue how to talk to women. Can you help? You came to the right guy. I'm not very confident, so I want you to act like you are. Just act. Like I was saying, you know, if people will think about you, what you think about yourself, so if you think you are confident and if you have a put on a confident body language, people will see you as confident and in a kind of dating area, you will have much more chance. 
And then eventually, you will start to see the results coming as a result of you faking this confidence. You will like the results. This result will feed into you actually starting to feel confident. Because I tell you, whether it's a if it's a job interview, for example, nobody wants to hire the person who lacks confidence. Nobody wants to hire a non-confident person. If you go and talk to an agent, you go to talk to someone who can put some geeks for you, and if you like not believing in yourself, it's going to be bloody hard for them to believe in you. So make sure you have a good night's sleep, not, you know, be serious, more serious sometimes. I know, guys, you, your lifestyle sometimes is, you know, you're artists, so it's obvious. You go out, have a couple of drinks, and maybe a spliff. I don't want to be kind of like with the stereotype here, but like, right? I, I know musicians, okay? So I like musicians, you know, I, I re uh, resonate to that. But it's like, okay, I have an important meeting tomorrow, especially this one here. <laughs> I have an important meeting tomorrow, okay, I'm not going to drink tonight. Or instead of the, the regular eight beers, I'm just going to have two, right? And I'm going to wake up, have a shower, have a coffee, Red Bull, and I'm going to go there. I'm going to sell myself. And guess what? First time you do it, you're going to fail because you haven't done it before. So when it comes, when I coach people on job interviews, I always say, don't just go for the ideal jobs. Don't just apply for the perfect jobs because you want to go for not so perfect ones for the interviews to practice your interview skills. So by the time the perfect job interview comes out, you are ready. So I remember back in retail, I would go for any kind of jobs. I remember interviewing for like mamas and papas, store manager of that shop. What do I know about kids? And, and I went there just for the experience. And sure enough, after going for 50 interviews, I became a bloody good on job interviews. And now I can coach people on how to become great on interviews. It's a skill. So then if you go present your work to someone for the first time, of course you're going to be a little bit all over the place because you haven't done it. But every time you go, you get a feedback and you use that feedback to be better next time. So don't be too picky, don't be too fussy. Try to talk to as many people as possible and put yourself in situations that are stressful. Because if the situation is stressful, it means that you need to experience it more and more. So it's not stressful anymore. So after maybe 100, 150 talks that I've given for like small groups, like 10 to 15 people, I got a phone call. Can you come and talk to a group of 120? And my initial response, you know what it was? What it was? No, I don't want to because that's going to be a nerve-wracking experience. I've never sp spoken to the group as big as that. 10, 15 people, I'm used to that, this is easy. This is within my comfort zone now. So when the guy said, can you come? And I was like, fuck, I don't want to do it. But because I felt like that, I, I instantly said, of course I need to do it. So I was like, don't be a pussy, go and do it. And I went and I did it, I was nervous. And then the first time I got a call to speak to 400 people, I was like, for fuck's sake, why are they calling me? Of course they're calling me because, you know, you're ready. I'm like, oh shit, and guess what? First time I spoke to 400 people, I was bloody nervous. I couldn't even stand still. I was walking, you know, around the stage. And now I can confidently speak to 400 people. Then they will call me to speak to 10,000 people. Guess what? I'll be nervous. But if you recognize that a situation or the prospect of a situation makes you anxious, it just says to me, to my mind, that I have to do it. Because I refuse to feel anxious about anything, personally. I refuse to be fearful about anything. I'm going to face the situation as long as I have to, to don't feel fearful about it anymore. But that's just my attitude, which I suggest you consider for yourself. Uh, Tommy, so that was the second and the first communication. There's a great book on communication um, called How to Make Friends and Influence People. If you haven't read it, I recommend you do read it. It's a classic on communication. And you know, why artists might struggle with communication sometimes is because, oh, I mean, if you think artists struggle with communications, you would need to see my IT clients. Why they struggle with communication? Because, <laughs> because uh, you know, if you spend your whole day in front of a computer not communicating with anyone, you, you don't use this part of your brain responsible for that. You don't practice that muscle. I haven't spent much time in front of a computer. I haven't spent much time at school, as we established. What I did instead was I was communicating. That's why I'm a good communicator. He said, I'm great, Osan. I don't know if I'm a great communicator. I'm a good communicator because all I do is communicating. You put me in front of the computer to solve a problem. I'm shit. 
Yeah, you ask me to do my accountancy by myself, I will laugh. You know, so we have all different skills, but we have the skills because we spent X amount of time on those particular skills. So we've learned to be good at it. So how to become good at communication? We gotta communicate. And yes, we can uh, read books like the one I've mentioned to, to, you know, to give us a good kickstart. But then ultimately, it will be about uh, experience of communicating with other people. So when it comes to communication, ask yourself, okay, what is the communication that you struggle with, whether this is one-to-one -one communication, communicating to groups, or communicating through social media, and then just come up with some strategies with some strategy as to how you're gonna communicate more in this particular situations. And guess what? Over time, you become a better communicator, guaranteed. Just like over time, your French will become better if you practice French, or your tennis will become uh, better if you practice tennis. It's as simple as that. Did I answer your questions, Tommy? Thank you. Um, yeah, I've got something to say. Um, it's more of just sharing something. Mm -hmm. um, You've talked a lot about money. Mm -hmm. That's cool. You love money. Everybody loves different things. But I, I kind of feel that maybe if you was to look at it in the perspective of defining a goal, mm -hmm. that might be a more better generalization of it. Mm -hmm. um, it could be just something as simple as, I want to finish writing a song yeah. this week. Um, and following on time from your point of getting turned down. I met this really cool guy once um, and he said to me, which would you rather choose, Matt? Would you rather choose at the end when you go home, you regret something uh, or you're rejected from what you've done? You go in and you speak to the record company and you say, I've got a really cool song. Do you want to listen to it? And you go in and they say, it's shit. I don't like it. Which would, you which would you rather choose at the end of the day? Would you rather walk in there and then you go in and they say, shit, and you come out and you say, oh, cool. well, I did it. Um, or would you rather finish the day thinking, man, I wish I'd done that. Yeah. Um, I watched this presentation like a few years ago, uh, and it was on the biggest five, the, the, the five things that people think about before they die. They actually went out and interviewed people. It's in the Telegraph, or something like that. And the yeah, number one thing is, I wish I'd done all the things that I wanted to do. Um, and so if you choose regression rather than rejection, you'll be one of these people at the end who says, Shit, I wish I'd done it. I wish I'd gone and knocked on the door ten times. I could have failed, but I'll never know because I didn't do it. Um, and that was just something I want to share. I was thinking about it quite a lot, stemming from the thought of goals. Yeah. Um, and that's just through like, my own personal Yeah, experience. thank you for that. I will add something to that. One of my favorite quotes, it says, in life we can either choose the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. That's the choice that we have to make. Pain of discipline, or the pa there's gonna be a pain, either way. But it's gonna be the pain of discipline or pain of regret. I don't enjoy everything that I do within my business, but I do them anyway because they're necessary. I absolutely fucking hated the process of writing my book. I hated it. But I was forcing myself every day for a month, for two hours every day to do it. And sometimes the experience wa was just painful. Most of the, most of the time was very painful. And it just to, just to mm. just like for like personally, like I'm pretty shy when it mm -hmm. comes to speaking in front of groups. And I sat here for like ten minutes thinking, well, say <laughs> when it comes to speaking to one to one people, uh -huh. or something like that, but just sitting in front of all you guys here, and I start, hang on a minute, Matt, you you got this really cool point to make, and it's something that you kind of like move drive yourself by a lot in what you do uh -huh. because I've gone through like a lot of different experiences. Um, you gotta just do it, and yeah. that's 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 probably the, the, the biggest thing that I would share with people is just have that, and it will mm -hmm. give you the passion and the drive. Kick yourself off the arse, yeah, and fucking do it. Yeah, um, 
and you might fail. <laughs> you might fail, but at least you tried. That's it. At least you tried. You won't be one of these people at the end of your life who says, shit. I haven't even tried it. Yeah. yeah. The last thing I want to feel on my deathbed is the regret for not trying something. Failing is fine. I can take failing any day. Guys, any more questions or yeah. comments? Yeah. I'd like to mention that I think we're running over time now. So if there is any other question that you have in mind, Cheers, mate. just raise the hand and, and Okay. Mind. I'll be very brief with my answers as well then. Um, I just want to get your perspective on something. Me and Tommy had a chat about this about a week or two ago. Um, with the idea of making money through music, there is the fear of um, kind of a loss of musical integrity, mm -hmm. which we came to the conclusion of if, a, if an artist is willing to work a shitty day job to support their music, that's no different to saying I would session on a pop record or, or write for someone else. You know, But I find a lot of artists are very afraid of this idea of being seen as... I hate the word sellout. I think it's the dumbest word anyone's ever invented for music. It's a pathetic term. But um, I was curious of your kind of perspective on that. Should we, as artists, be kind of concerned of this? Or, or are, we, are we kicking ourselves in the arse by being afraid of this thing? Right. Um, you see, the way I look at uh, achieving goals is that, and I kind of mentioned that already, is that... I, I, I will do whatever it takes you know, to achieve my goal. So if your goal is to achieve certain thing in music and you realize to, that for you to do that, you need to do some pop stuff that you don't like, for example, go and fucking do it. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, you'd be better off doing that than working at a Tesco checkout because at least it's more related to your industry. You know. And then, oh, because my friends, this, my friends, that. Fuck the friends. If you feel that this is the right thing for you to do. I'm not afraid to lose all of my friends today by making a decision, by following my heart. Yeah, it's like I expect my friends, the real friends, to support my decisions. Unless I'm saying, you know what, I'm going to experiment with heroin. Then I want to fucking slap on my face. But everything else, you know, I expect my friends to support my decisions. And you know what happens? It's like I work with this one guy right now, this big property guy. He came to me after taking coke for ten years straight. You know, like three grams a day. Like he was a, ma sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but then you know, the night before coming to me, he 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 said he would commit suicide if not the kids that he has. Really great guy. If not the fact that he had two kids, he has two kids. You know, and so the kids kept him alive. He said. It's like Michael, but you know, we were talking about it, this, discussing this whole coke, this whole lifestyle. It's like, Michael, I'm this kind of industry, and you know, everybody's taking coke on this level anyway. It's like when I meet these people, there's always coke. And I said, listen, so on one side, we have your fucking life and the life of your family. You're the only provider, and your kids are in private schools, whatever. And on the other side, we have a bunch of your other friends taking coke. And you're trying to tell me that this is more important than this. Are you fucking crazy? Yeah, you're right. Of course I'm right. And I said, and I remember having this consultation with him on first session, and I said, you know, there's a group of friends, everybody has this lifestyle, and you are not happy with this lifestyle. Guess what? They're probably not either, because who's going to be happy taking coke after 10 years, you know, with all the effects, side effects? But I said, somebody within your group has to change so the other can follow. And sure enough, my client stopped, he, he was... He's, he's been clear for three weeks. And then the friends, one by one, started to realize, shit, you know, it is possible not to take coke. And, okay, he just led the way, and now they're following. You know, so you, you might have an idea, and everybody around you would say, whoa, whoa, how can you do this? But then sure enough, if your idea is working, other people will follow. And you're going to be suddenly positioning yourself as the leader of the group. The one who had the balls to say, you know what, enough with this. Or... Let's start with this. And of course, it's down to you know, how brave you are and how much you believe in yourself and in the fact that if you, do, if you go this way, this is going to be the right thing for you or for whatever, for the industry. I always had, you know, it's easy for me because I always had this courage. I don't know where does it come from because my parents are not like that. I always had this courage to say, you know what, that's bullshit. 
this is great. I'm going to go this. Everybody's going this way. I'm going this way. Not because everybody's going this way. It's because I believe in this way. But I'm doing quite fine. So that kind of works. Because people respect you if you're like that. And then sure enough, they will start to follow you, you know? My last question. Uh -huh. um, it's a bit tricky one. Oh, yeah, bring on, the, bring on the tricky questions. Okay, um, over here in this, I've seen how of aware human being you are. Um, uh, or pretending you, to be. Or pretending to be, whatever it is, it's, it's pretty good, um, inspiring. Okay, if you, from a musician's point of view, mm -hmm. would you say you've got a better chance sober? Or would you just say discipline yourself? Okay, very good point. I, I don't think you have any chance at all if you're always fucked. Yeah, when you think take, about... Take the other extreme out of it. Yeah, it's... it's, it's um, I tell you how I operate right now in my business. So Monday to Friday, the main focus is business. And when I drink, I drink one, two units, you know. It doesn't affect me at all. And then the weekend comes and I can do whatever the fuck I want. So I would drink a lot, you know. I would take coke sometimes and I love it. But you know, by Monday morning, I'm sharp. So it's kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a discipline, it's a balance, you know? So that's now, but you see, like as I was saying, the first two and a half years of growing my business, there was no women, there was no alcohol, there was no coke, none of this, yeah, like a monk. And I think if you look at the most successful bands and you see them going crazy and demolishing uh, hotel rooms, it's not hard to think they've probably always been operating like that. But my guess would be that probably they didn't. Because, because if they were like that in the beginning, they probably wouldn't get to this place where that I got to that I can kind of let myself go every now and then. You know? So um, in terms of modeling ourselves on people that are more successful than us in our industry, it's good to look at how they were and what they were doing when they started, not when they are right now. Because if I look at Anthony Robbins, who's the biggest guy in my industry, worth $480 million, if I look at what he does right now, he's on another level. So that, that doesn't, it's not going to help me. But if I, if, I, if I study his biography, which I did, and I see what he done at that stage, that can help me a lot. So if you look using you know, the, the example of being a musician, um, if you look at what successful bands are doing right now, what kind of lifestyle they have, and you try to model that, then you might be in trouble. Because you see, the fact that they can allow themselves to, to live this lifestyle, it doesn't mean that if you live this lifestyle right now, you will get to where they are right now. Plus, they have the money to have this lifestyle as well. You know? And now, in, in, the first, uh, in the first part of my business, I didn't want to spend money on alcohol and on dates, because I wanted to use this money to put it in my business. Right? Tommy, Tommy's cutting me. Can I just wrap up with uh, just saying something? Um, For one minute? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Two minutes. So, um, guys, it's been a pleasure be he being here. Um, I would like to invite you for a coffee to my place. Not all of you in the same time, you know? My, my place is it's not that big. I'm in. Sorry? You're in. So, <laughs> but like, hold on. Um, those of you that think that you could benefit from coaching, yeah? And not just that, that's one condition. Another condition is those of you that are not gonna come and say how shit life is and London and industry. I don't wanna hear this bullshit. I'm not, I have no interest in negativity whatsoever. If you say, you know what, well, I'm a positive thinker, I know I can do it, I'm struggling, that's another story. I'm not talking about this. But if you wanna come and say that your parents are there to blame, that you, the, the the government is there to blame, that the music industry is there to blame. I don't want to hear this, so don't come. Now, I know I've told you how much I charge. I charge up to this much, and I'm like, oh, I could do coaching, but I can't afford this. Don't worry, because I have a team of associates, and between me and my associates, we cover all different budgets. Now, if you don't have any money for coaching whatsoever, which is fine, then you want to go to Gumtree, type in live coaching, and you will see a bunch of coaches, which I don't know, but there's a bunch of coaches that will coach you for free. And I promise you, this free coaching, if you find a coach that you resonate with, will be better, much better than not having a coach at all. So if you have no budget whatsoever, if 
find yourself a coach on Gumtree. If you have some budget, put your name there with Thomas, who is my, one of my associates. Put your name there. I will send you an email. We'll schedule a coffee in my place over the next few weeks where we're going to discuss where you are, where you want to be, and how coaching can help you get there. Right? And if you have no budget now and you're going to make it big in five years, you're going to give me a call then. And I will, you can fly me to Miami. I will coach you there as well. You know? And we have a Coke afterwards. There's my book uh, called From Good to Amazing um, there as well. And there's some cards. You can check out my website. And please follow me on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. I post lots of stuff. And if nothing else, it will inspire you maybe every now and then. Thank you. Uh, just, just, I'm going to send you over an email. Yeah. If you get my card from there, if you go to my website, there are links, the icons of different social media platforms, and you can just go straight there. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, guys. One little thing I would like to do for the first time. I saw that at an event I was with, with Felipe. And people started sharing like little quotes or stuff that they still think about. Things that, you know, they're stuck in their head. So I would like you to maybe shout a little bit like louder so we don't have to move the microphone around. But just tell me, share stuff that you're thinking about things that you're going to be writing down or probably you wrote down already and probably you're going to be telling your friends about so people that kept notes first of all hello annie over there come on let's get the ball rolling i'm not going to go Nobody's going. Oh, well, I don't um, from Mike, um, mute your self-doubt. It's temporary, as it doesn't exist after you already believe. Oh, I'm right, um, this and that. Forget that. It's only lasts for a moment. Carry on doing what you're doing. Right. I've been like doing a lot of, I don't know, reading a lot into like life coaching and you know, like music, and I think there's a lot like from. Like, I've been surrounded by musicians all the time. I think there's, like, a lot of us just lack of confidence and, like, vision. And, like, if you hear what Michael said, it's, like, it's all about how to know exactly where you want to know, where you want to go. Because, I mean, it's, like, well, I'm going out today. And I was, like, where am I going? So you're going to stay in. But if you go, I'm going there, then you're going to go. So I think that's what I got mostly out of today. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Yeah. All right. Yes, please. A little I bit louder. Love, I love the part <clears throat> when you talked about the man in the Shawshank Redemption, all right, who said, oh, he wrote a letter to the, um, to the state people for how many years, and they read it, and he said, do you know what? I'll start writing two letters a week. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> Perseverance. The key one. All right, anybody else? Followers don't pay. Followers don't pay. All right. <laughs> um, the importance of having clear, specific goals. Because it's so, yeah, I find it's so easy to kind of be vague and say, oh, I want to get to this point, but, or I want to have a lot of money, but not being specific about what you want is, and I agree with the universe uh, and, and things like that. What you put out, you get back. So. Great. Right. Mm -hmm. Having a strategy and, and then, doing it That's strategy strategy don't dream it just do it <laughs> all right these are quite inspirational stuff so you wanted not to inspire us but i think you did all right anybody else who want to share something before we wrap up and go downstairs for a beer i think you said if your goal is bigger than you people come to you uh, that rhymes as well <laughs> anybody write a song about it <laughs> say it again All right. If because um, it's not just thinking about yourself, it's just just a beyond beyond you. So that's that's that's, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's, I think it's a point that resonated very strongly was like, uh, be unafraid of failing. Don't be afraid to fail, and then just do it again. You gotta do it. 
Yeah. If you fuck up, you learn. Hello? Uh, no, I was, gonna say, I was gonna add that do something that scares you and you know, get out of your comfort zone, which is something that we probably all struggle with. But it's, it's good. The moment when you get scared, it's like, well, okay, yeah, maybe I have to then go and do it. Exactly. It's the moment where you feel something, your, your body warning you, then it's the moment that you need to go for it because it's outside your comfort zone. Great. Any, any, any closing words? You said the thing. Do you want me to take that? Oh, no, it's all right, it's all right. It's all right. I didn't know if you were pointing at me, Fred. Thank you. You asked about getting uh, people getting fucked up. I played metal for the last 10 years. I know a lot about getting fucked up and going on tour. It's, it doesn't work because it, it creates a bubble. Your whole persona gets turned into the idea that you are this fucked up musician. And one day you wake up in a, in a van and you realize that you just don't feel that way. And it, it destroys what you are. If you can't do it sober, then you can't fucking do it. So if you rely on alcohol or drugs or whatever to fuel your art, it, it's going to be a bubble and bubbles pop. Use it to add a bit of creativity. Don't rely on it. Thank you. So this was another month of Darker Music Talks. The next month, 7th of August. Write it down. It's the next one. Uh, I don't know which topic is going to be about. I'm going to email you anyways. I hope you, you enjoyed it. Use the hashtag Darker Music Talks to talk about it on Twitter. Reach out to, to Michael. I'm going to send you all the links, everything you need to know. We're having a presentation this time, so I'm not going to send you a presentation. But whatever you feel like, Michael was there. Um, I think I heard that he's not sleeping at all. He's just closing a little bit his eyes, and then he's ready to answer every tweet or Facebook message. So just spam him and hustle him. So, yeah, let's go downstairs for beer, and uh, we'll talk more.